<sighs> I ran out of shelf space months ago. Ash, box for you. So we are picking up with Handbook for Morals, part two. So the Grand Book O Controversies, the, dare I say it, the Grimoire of Controversies, just keeps providing. We do have half a book to go through, and there's some really good stupid in here, trust me. The uh, semi-climax gets so badly mishandled, it's, I love it. And there is kind of an open secret about the reason this book exists, and that is that is linked to the big controversy I want to talk about, but we'll discuss a few other things in the meantime. It'll be much juicier later. Hey guys, Editor Crimson here. One thing that I came across while I was uh, doing some last second research to double check something, apparently there was an internet rumor going around claiming that Lanny Serum was the author of the infamous my Immortal, the worst fan fiction ever made. I've actually dug into that a little bit, and it looks like it's not actually true. Apparently there was going to be a memoir written about My Immortal, and the publishing company behind it did some research to investigate, and one of the things they double-checked on was to see if the rumors were true, and Lanny Serum did write My Immortal, and they concluded that no, they did not. There are certainly similarities in their writing styles, and both My Immortal and Handbook for Mortals are awful, but... My Immortal was written by somebody else. And okay, that's it. Back to the review. For now, though, we just return to Zade as she is surviving weeks later in the theater. Now, just to give you a brief recap, Zade was living in some little town in Tennessee, moved to Las Vegas, has actual magic, became a performer, and there are these two guys who kind of like her. And that's pretty much everything relevant. How much... Wasted space is that. You know, the sad thing is by the end of the year when I'm done with this book, I'll remember like two things, the love triangle and the big final trick. Anyway, I'm stalling. So Zayd is still wandering around the theater doing her thing, living her life, and her thoughts, like all 25 year olds, keep revolving around boys. Jackson and I agreed on almost anything that came up and everything seemed easy with him. If I had written on a piece of paper all the things I wanted in a guy, well, he would have fit it to a T, except my ideal guy would also have powers. Well, I mean, as long as you're not asking for too much. It's actually deeply frowned upon for someone like me to end up with a mortal. Now, Serum does a lousy job explaining what the magic is, how the magic works, how it manifests, anything like that, but she does have an explanation for why witches or immortals or whatever are not supposed to be with mortals. The easiest way I can simplify this is the group or council or whoever made this rule is basically made up of Slytherins. You're not supposed to mix, and that's not a phrase I'm making up, it's in the book. You don't know if your children will be mortal or gifted. You filthy little mob blood. Moving on from there, uh, there is something that I did want to discuss about the writing style. Now, certain writers, certain authors, have distinct tricks that they often rely on. Dan Brown is an easy example of that. He basically writes the same story over and over again. I still like his work, granted, but he is very formulaic. Michael Crichton brings in his characters in very much the same way, where they are introduced one at a time, and then they all come together, and then the plot happens. Being able to sum up an author by their writing style, their writing tricks, is not something that's always bad, but it certainly can be in this case. Especially because there are three points that I would sum up Serum's writing style. She's wordy as fuck. She violates show don't tell in the weirdest way and she has the longest gaps between her dialogue now i think i've already hammered home just how wordy she is so i don't need to touch on that the dialogue one is a little difficult to show because what she'll do is she'll write a line of dialogue and then we get zade's perspective on everything in that particular moment someone else will talk, and then we get another paragraph long gap as she describes some other minute aspect of that thing. 
It's like having a conversation between two people punctuated by both of them having long Vietnam flashbacks. You mean people are watching us right now? Right now! But I'm not wearing any pants. For example, you got this scene where Zaid is in a bar with some of the crew, and then some guy she doesn't know just comes up and starts talking to her. And we get none of their conversation. I'm not even going to bother reading this, I'll just have it on screen. You can see there's not a single bit of dialogue between Zaid and this guy. She just says, he was bothering me. He was obviously hitting on me, even though I was not even remotely interested. We don't even get his name until the very end of the page when he introduces himself to Mac, who comes in to save Zaid. Now this guy, Justin, is clearly very drunk, a point which is elaborated on very extensively, when Mac grabs... Okay, so Justin grabs Zaid and tries to walk off with her, and then Mac grabs him by the arm and forces him to let go. So. Justin responds with, Oh, you jerk face! What's your problem, man? Obviously Sarah misunderstood it when Shakespeare said brevity is the soul of wit. And then we get a lot of fluff as Mac defends Zaid and Justin is drunk and he tries to start a fight but ends up running into a bar like a support beam and like knocks himself out so his friends drag him outside. I wouldn't even mind it that much if the guys in this book didn't unironically act like the boys in the episode of South Park about boobs. <laughs> and the fight is such a non sequitur. This is just an excuse for Serum to show off guys fighting over Zaid because that's a thing. Two pages of buildup and Justin knocks himself out, so we don't even get a real fight scene. Why waste my time with this? And that was pretty much all of chapter 10. One nothing fight scene while Zaid thinks about boys. Also in this chapter, we get an example of, and I'll start pointing these out now because they become more prevalent, but a fascinating misuse of tell, don't show. I have complained plenty of times about authors violating show, don't tell. It is something with alarming frequency in these longer book reviews, but it's important because show, don't tell is a cornerstone of writing. If you over explain things to your audience, they're less engaged. Design enough of the world so that they can understand what's going on, but still put their own touches on it. Serum, however, has somehow violated that rule in a way that I've never seen before. Not this prevalently, anyway. Because Serum does show and tell. Take this scene when she's in the bar. This is after the fight scene, and she's sitting with some of the other girls in the crew. And someone calls her name. Zaid explains that someone was calling her name. And then we see someone call her name. I finally heard someone saying my name over and over and snapped out of my daze to realize that all the other girls at the table were just staring at me. Perla, a tall, dark-haired girl with perfect lips who was one of the acrobats in the show, had been saying my name. Zaid, 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 are you okay? It would be so much more effective if she never told us about that and if we just got the Zaid Zaid thing instead. Instead of Zaid over explaining that her thoughts were interrupted, show her thoughts being interrupted when someone calls her name. That way the reader is in the same position as Zaid and is that much more engaged and attached to what Zaid is going through. It's relatable and without that relatability the reader can't get into the story. We get another show and tell violation as Zaid explains that she had left the door wide open. And then Jackson comes in and says, the door was open. Sometimes you do need to reestablish certain things to make sure that the reader is still abreast of what's going on, but it generally takes longer than a single sentence in between moments. Jackson comes in to invite Zaid to his uh, show later after work, and Zaid apologizes that she can't. Oh, I can't tonight, I said, genuinely apologetic. I'd love to, really, but I've got that new illusion to work on with Charles. This is the first time we hear about this grand new illusion that she's doing with Charles. 
and it gets hinted at sporadically and eventually revealed later on. That's good. That is how you should introduce that kind of thing. Entice the reader. Have them want to find out what's going on. But the payoff is not worth it. It is a basic setup and payoff problem. You introduce something, you, you give little hints to what's going on, and then at the end when it's revealed, oh my god, that was amazing! That's why murder mysteries are so great. That's why a lot of cop shows keep getting made. Because you sprinkle in these little hints of where the mystery is going, where the story is going, and by the end, well, you know, if it's written well, you'll be able to follow along with it. There's a bit of foreshadowing that leads nowhere because Zeb and uh, Zaid comes across Zeb and Charles having a discussion about something ominous. It's not good, that much I can tell you. I just don't know how bad and what it means. I heard Zeb say, sounding worried. By the way, nice typo there. Charles responded in an equally grievous tone. You know we have to let things take their own course. You must let it go for now. Was it something I'd done? Was I going to be fired? Zeb, for some reason, doesn't like Zaid, and that's not ever really fleshed out. It's just used for artificial tension because it doesn't mean anything. But what I take away from this is Zaid's flash-in-the-pan anxiety. Now, anxiety is one of those things that everyone has to varying degrees, uh, some more than others, and it's perfectly fine as a character trait. It actually could do a lot to heighten the character's uh, situational awareness, or their worries about certain things, or fears, or any number of, you know, moments. But to include it as a trait for the protagonist, it should actually mean something. Zade's anxiety is used very short term to momentarily heighten some sort of potential drama which never goes anywhere. Zade is never at risk for being fired, especially later on when you find out what's actually going on behind the scenes, and you'll see that reveal coming by the time it rears its head, trust me. But moments like this don't make any sense when you step back and try to view the story as a whole. Zade's not at risk of being fired. She should know she's not at risk of being fired. And yet, that moment is introduced in order to get the, the reader to think, oh, could there be some moment of intrigue? Could Zaid be in trouble? It's a red herring. It goes nowhere. It's fine that Zaid feels anxious, but it doesn't serve the story, and it doesn't really serve the character, because she so rarely actually shows anxiety outside of very brief moments like this. She's calm by the end of the passage, so it goes nowhere. Uh, note from earlier, page 117 is the longest uninterrupted discussion in the entire book. And it is sad how confidently I can state that. Moving on, we get a scene of the crew hanging out backstage, when, just waiting to clock out, and they're talking about their upcoming camping trip, which was apparently Zaid's idea. Well, because she's working on this new illusion with Spellman, she actually has to skip, so she can work the weekend and perfect it with him. This upsets Mech, again because it was Zaid's idea, so in order to make up for it, she offers to make dinner for him. This is a somewhat intimate moment that's treated very casually, possibly as if they've done this before. And considering how many times we've gotten the weeks later starting to a chapter, I'm still unclear as to what their relationship is. Because they've been making out on and off, apparently, for several weeks now, and yet are not really a couple. Zade has pretty much been leading Mac on for the last who knows how many weeks, possibly months. Hmm, that almost sounds like that thing his ex did. You know, the one that kind of scarred him emotionally. So a couple of days go by, Mac does swing by Zade's place for dinner as promised, when he notices a couple of tickets on her table to David Copperfield's show. It was the evening show, so they got dinner and a show. And apparently, Zade went with Spellman. You went to dinner and a show? I thought you were going to be working the whole time, he said, sounding brash and accusatory. Yes, and uh, remember Spellman's apparent tendency to date girls 
much, much his junior. It's even worse because apparently there's a photo of the two of them. And the photo, his voice was still monotone as he asked his questions. Oh, um, the camera girl who came around to our table was really cute. I think he was trying to hit on her, so we bought photos from her. Excuse me while I slip this gigantic red fish on screen. Now later on we find out what's actually going on, and it's not a big deal, but Zaid comes off as so callous in this section, I lost any chance of liking her. It's not that she was on thin ice with me, she was already neck deep in the water. This just tied an anchor around her wrists. Mac is clearly upset with this idea because you remember his last relationship, the one that Zaid knows about, and he asks her to clarify what's going on with this dinner. Why did you go out with Spellman when you told me you were going to be working? And Zaid replies with, A girl's gotta eat, doesn't she? I shrugged, not sure what he was getting at and why he looked so upset. You heartless bent! This is why Zaid doesn't work as a romantic partner. There's no chemistry because she can't possibly conceive why Mac would possibly get upset. The guy who was used and tossed aside and has problems with that. And Zaid, from her own perspective, does not understand why he's upset. Zaid doesn't understand why Mac might be upset. She comes off as withdrawn, like she's holding something back. It's odd and gives Mac reason to be suspicious. This is especially concerning for him, considering his history with relationships with performers, which she well, which she is well aware of. She isn't considering his feelings at all and isn't trying to reassure him. She just brushes it off with, a girl's gotta eat. Even if they aren't in a relationship, this is a red flag since it shows she doesn't really have empathy. Then again, maybe she's not used to thinking about others if guys are just magically drawn to her. Chapter 12, The Sun, or as I like to call it, Nobody Likes Me, The Chapter. It opens up with Zaid running into Zeb, who is the head magician and, remember, doesn't really seem to like Zaid. Hi, Zeb. What's up? I asked. You aren't ready for this. You should have been more prepared. I didn't know what he meant and wasn't sure how to respond. But I had been really frustrated with how little he seemed to like me and how cold he was. I ignored his comments and went straight to the heart of what I wanted to ask him ever since I had met him. Why don't you like me? Zeb looked confused. I never said I didn't. Some things don't have to be said. You certainly act like you don't. Zeb looked frustrated. I just don't think you take our craft seriously. I take it very seriously. You need to try harder. Really important things are at stake. So uh, yeah, Zeb's a mage. And after that, he promises to help her train if she's serious about it which is weird because if there's like more at stake than she realizes then shouldn't he be helping regardless but whatever and then we get a scene of Sophia and Zaid chatting and they, there was a lot of animosity between those two beforehand but this scene is where Zaid talks to Sophia and he asks you know why don't you like me and Sophia responds with I don't hate you I just believe that people should pay their dues. I had to, yet you walked in and were treated like you owned the place. A fair statement, because that's effectively what happened, and again, the reason why is explained later, but we'll get to it when we get to it. My first thought was to turn around and walk away, but after my confrontation with Zeb, something stronger in me just wanted to talk to her. In other words, Serum didn't know how to move the plot along. Zaid had walked into Sophia while Sophia was singing, and apparently was like, really beautiful. And the two start talking, explaining how they feel about each other, and then Zaid offers to get Sophia a part in the big illusion that she's working on with, uh, with Spellman. It's entirely superficial. Sophia would just be singing outside of the actual act, so this does kind of improve the relationship between uh, Sophia and Zaid, and Sophia stops being the mean girl and really becomes a background character, like more so than she already was. This could have been some dramatic character exposition, some sort of display of Zayd's limitations because apparently women aren't supposed to really like her that much, but now Sophia and her are on good terms. I'm not saying it's bad necessarily, it just makes me ask, why introduce Sophia as the mean girl if you're not going to do anything substantial with it. We are halfway through the book, 
And one of the more notable character interactions has been resolved. It doesn't go anywhere, and that is the best way I can sum up so much of this book. Especially because you get stupid lines like this. Would you mind if I asked you to sing something during the finale? The new illusion that Charlie and I are building, I would love to have... Did you just call Charles Charlie? I watched Sophia's eyes bulge and her jaw drop. Her chin jutted forward and her perfect flowing hair with big curls fell ever so slightly towards her face. Yeah? I paused for a moment to think about exactly what I had said, unsure of why I would gotten such a strong reaction. Why? I did that once and he bit my head off! She shrugged and the right side of her lip pulled up slightly as she raised her eyebrows. And I was on top of him at the time! I mean, ignoring the confrontational name drop there, because Spellman's not in the room to hear it, so what's it matter? But uh, keep that moment in mind along with many other things, because this attaches itself to that growing red herring that the book is so eagerly focusing on. We get another kiss between Mac and Zaid, and then... We go into what I can only describe is a shockingly irrelevant establishing shot. The next day, I had to go into the theater early to work on the new illusion. I had been there already for a few hours before I was able to take a lunch break. I had decided to walk across to the fashion show mall and eat there since I had extra time compared to my usual break between shows. You don't establish one setting if you are going to immediately jump to another setting! A much better way to approach that is... We had been working on the show all morning, and I decided to take a lunch break by going to the mall that I hate to go to. Why is she going to the mall anyway? You know, the mall that quickly makes her tired and cranky quickly. Well, Zade runs into Jackson again, literally, and then they run into a fan, a little girl named Sarah, probably seven or eight according to the book, who gets a photo with Zade and then leaves, so that amounts to nothing. And then Zade gives us some detail about herself that is as irrelevant as it is blunt. Jackson studied me. You take your work really seriously. I like that about you. He nodded. I blushed again. You know what they say. Surround yourself with people that take their work seriously, but not themselves. I loved quotes and sayings. I had one for almost every situation, and I could rattle them off all day. I guess it made me feel like I could always comment on something without sounding dumb. Though, I was starting to wonder if I used them too much, and if it made me sound cheesy. She almost never uses quotes. The character that we're seeing on page, and the character that exists in Serum's head, are vastly different. If we do not see Zade actually using these quotes, then it is fallacious to have her explain, I loved having quotes, and I had a, a quote for every situation. Chapter 13 opens, like so many others, with... More weeks flew by. Part of the problem I'm having as I'm going through this book again is the chapters are so indistinct and have so little character about themselves that I don't really remember what happens until I'm like halfway into the chapter and going through my notes again. Like when you're rereading a book and you you get to a certain opening of a certain chapter, you're like, oh, this is when they discover the body under the pier. You can't do that with this book. Every chapter feels so much like the others in that it's just a bunch of bland, empty nothingness that nothing stands out. Well, nothing good, anyway. I only get excited about certain parts of this because of how gloriously terrible they are. We get more flirting between Zade and Mac, which at this point is frustrating because even though that's the kind of thing that a lot of romance novels are based on, it they're not in a relationship yet. It, it's been God only knows how many months, and they're not together in any definable way. So when you get flirting like, You know how hot you look in that harness? Mac asked. You'd say I looked hot in a burlap sack. I shook my head at him, but I had a pretty big smile on my face. You'd look amazing in anything, he said with a mischievous twinkle in his eye, and even better, in nothing. 
he added as he rubbed his hand over the small of my back. In a well-written romance story, something like that might actually lead to something. It might actually be a little tantalizing. In here, it feels obligatory. Like, they're just doing it because it's a paint-by-numbers sort of book, and this is the part where they gotta do the heavy flirting. Halfway through the book, it feels like they're drawing out that not-in-a-relationship plot point just to draw it out. It's frustrating. Oh, also, there's another uh, mage in the show named Renee, but I don't think she ever shows up again, so I don't know why she's mentioned. Ah, and we get another italicized scene, as apparently I'm not the only one frustrated with how long this is taking to define. Spellman takes Mac back to, the, to his office to discuss his relationship, his intentions with Zade. And Mac at first says, we're friends if that's what you mean. But then eventually, by the end of the chapter and several pages says, well, it has possibility. We also get some really weak and pretentious philosophy as Serum attempts to discuss how deep love is and how it affects people. Charles broke into Mac's reverie and reminded him, that's not what I asked. I asked if you loved her. Again, Mac wasn't sure how to respond. He wasn't ready to admit something to Charles that he also wasn't ready to admit to himself. He thought about all the reasons that he shouldn't be in love with Zade. Then he thought about what else he knew. He had learned that the funny thing about love is that love doesn't care if you've labeled it or not. And it also doesn't care if there might be someone else vying for the person you love. Jealousy might, but not love. You can love someone who doesn't even know you really exist. Love really knows no boundaries and sometimes it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. You can wish it away all you want, but it just like Cupid's arrows, once you've been hit, you've been hit. The sad thing is that I've seen a better description of love and its effects on people as told by a stick puppet on South Park. Love isn't a decision, it's a feeling. If we could decide who we loved, it would be much simpler, but much less magical. And I would be remiss if I missed out on this line. Mac just thinks that Charles is being weird, so he thinks... Mac always thought it was funny that if you were rich, you were eccentric, and if you weren't rich or famous, you were just weird. He refused to call anyone eccentric just because they happened to have money or fame. I have no idea why that was included. And the next scene is Mac and Zade walking around town. And do you remember how pivotal that uh, that scene with the lemonade stand was in the mall? Well, we've got something very similar. When some biker bumps into Zade and her purse opens up and she spills all of her cards. And he doesn't stop to apologize or anything. He needed to learn to be nicer and more courteous around other people and not knock people out of the way like that. I wondered if I had been a little kid or an older person, what would have happened? He hadn't stopped to check on me or even yelled back, sorry, or anything. Before I had even thought about what I was doing, I balled my fists quickly and squeezed. The biker flipped upside down as if he'd hit a massive pothole that came out of nowhere. Or at least, to anyone else, it probably looked like that. He landed pretty hard on his back and made a few loud sounds of shrieking pain as the bike crashed into a bench, sending a few pieces going in different places. I was fairly certain he wasn't permanently injured, but he also wasn't going to be riding anymore today. I am getting really strong Empress Teresa vibes right now. How dare you not acknowledge the protagonist? Horrible agony for you! I'd hoped what I'd done to the biker might teach him a karma-related lesson. <laughs> However, with her cards spilled out on the ground, Mac notices they're all tarot cards, and he's a little skeptical towards tarot. That stuff is hogwash, he growled. You're too smart to believe in stuff like that. You shouldn't believe in something just because your parents do, or your family does. He shook his head at me as if I were a child who had broken a jar in the kitchen and was getting reprimanded. I've been a bad boy! And they have a long conversation about whether or not Tara was real, and Zade, of course, never reveals that she actually can do magic, so... This just becomes a point of contention that starts between them. It's something the book is slowly building towards, and on a technical level, I do appreciate what's, what Serum is trying for, because 
for weeks and weeks and weeks, Zade and Mac have been slowly getting together, but now it looks like maybe things won't work out because, you know, the tarot card said that Mac wouldn't be as fulfilling as uh, uh, Jackson, and, and now Mac is throwing shade at tarot reading and, and uh, what Zade's mother does. Plus, Mac's budding suspicion about what Zade is doing with Spellman when they went to that Copperfield show. And not just because, at the same time, Zade is also going out with Jackson! Several days later, I took Jackson up on another offer he made to take me to the movies. Of course, he chose the latest action superhero flick starring Ryan Reynolds. And because this book came out in 2017 and Deadpool came out in 2016, I'm calling it. They went and saw Deadpool, which is made even better because that movie opens with this line. You're probably thinking, my boyfriend said this was a superhero movie, but that guy in the red suit just turned that other guy into a fucking kebab. But because Deadpool is the best superhero character ever written, and because Deadpool the movie was the best superhero movie in the last decade, <laughs> Zayd ends up having a really good time. Back outside the theater, Jackson offered me his arm before leading me up the street. I still get giddy every time he does that. It makes me feel reassured and special. And there's more giggling, more joking, more flirting, and the ever-so-lewd act of holding hands. And the date ends with, I'll take that as a compliment, he replied, cupping my face in both hands, and I'll take this, too. With that, he kissed me passionately while bending me back like they do in the movies until my knee popped, which anyone who's ever seen any romantic movie would know is a very good thing. I couldn't keep a straight face. Ladies, hold your men to a higher standard. If your knees aren't popping, when he makes out with you, he's doing it wrong! Don't go away! <laughs> Come on here, girl! Let me show you! <laughs> <laughs> it seems like this that kind of really bother me because it's such a blatant waste of time. That date scene only exists to make Jackson look like a serious competitor in this love triangle because that's the only one which everything's really going right. There's no conflict, there's no tension, there's, there's this really hot making out, and Zay's really happy with the guy. So of course, she's not going to end up with him, she's going to end up with Mac because that's where the conflict is and that's where the story is. It's too perfect and because of that you can tell so easily that Jackson's not really here for any reason outside of shallow narrative conflict. Chapter 14, Wheel of Fortune. Pretty much all of Wheel of Fortune is to help drive that wedge between Zayd and Mac, and you really have two moments that matter. So they finish setting up everything for this brand new illusion, and as a reward for the crew working so hard and so diligently, Spellman takes them all out to the Pepper Mill, a Vegas staple. It has been around since the 1970s. I don't know how true that it is, but honestly, I find it refreshing that they're not in a mall, the theater, or a bar. And part of how Sarum attempts to drive that wedge between Zaid and um, Mac is this. Everyone's sitting around a big table for dinner, everyone is picking their chairs. Sophia, of course, uh, sits next to Spellman when this happens. Charles leaned towards Sophia, trying to be subtle, but I happened to be standing close enough to hear what he said to her. Sophie, darling, he said softly, I need Zade to sit next to me. Can you and Mac find seats somewhere else? What? Sophia hissed, shooting a look at me that could have killed. Don't make a big deal about this, Charles warned. And Spellman begins to heap praise upon Zade for being his little starlet. All the while, Zade attempts to salvage a relationship with Mac by sending her not an explanation, but a really sad looking emoji. And it's this. It's really sad looking. And he sends one that's kind of nonchalant and doesn't care. We get confirmation it's been several months since they started working on the illusion alone, so that gives you a time frame of how long Zade and Mac have not been going out. And that last big moment to really piss off Mac and to, to get him to not want to be anywhere near Zade is when he walks by Spellman's office 
and Spellman and Zade are inside talking. Charles pulled back and looked her right in the eye, his arms still around her. I'm just being an old man, I guess. I love you more than life itself. It would kill me if something happened to you. Zade was smiling as, he, as she put her hands on his face. I love you too. She leaned in to kiss him, her face beaming. Mac was disgusted and devastated. How could Zade betray him like that? The man she's not going out with, apparently. After everything they had together, hadn't he put up with enough with the whole Jackson situation? God, fuck you, Mac. Angry and frustrated, he couldn't bear to watch her kiss him. And that right there, if the scene had stopped right there, that could work as a red herring, because that's all this is, it's a red herring. But the book has to ruin the red herring as soon as it finished setting it up by going on with this. Had he only watched just a moment or two longer, he would have seen Zaid kiss Charles innocently on the cheek. Mac didn't see that though because he looked away be uh, before he saw the truth and therefore in his head he had turned around right before he saw them make out with tongue. Furious and upset, he stormed down the hall. He needed to think before he did anything that he would regret. It is impressive how much time Sarum spent, how many chapters Sarum spent building up this red herring of, oh my god, is Zade having an affair with Spellman? Only to immediately drop the ball to avoid any undue controversy. I am, I am kind of flabbergasted at how much of a missed step that is. It was like if you had Sherlock Holmes wander into a scene, find a, a murder victim, and then think to himself, well, it was actually Ted Johnson who lives down the street, but we didn't figure that out until later. I haven't seen a misstep this substantial since the Mortal Instruments movie, when they revealed that the, wh whatever the hell their names were, uh, were not actually siblings. Part of the reason the romance angle in that series was was as heavy as it was is because for a while you didn't know if the t the protagonist and the love interest were actually siblings or not. That sounds absolutely preposterous saying it out loud, but fans of the series, I imagine, would agree with me. Mac is of course upset by this whole situation, not unduly considering his past, and he goes to confront Zade about it. And Mac immediately assumes that Zade is just being like Clara and is just sleeping around with everyone but him. Zade doesn't really do herself any favors by saying, Sometimes relationships aren't black and white, Mac. And sometimes what you see isn't what's really there. How about you let me do this show, then we can talk about this. Then he kind of takes another step down shit creek and he gives us this line. Mac wasn't hearing any of it, though, and stepped back. So you can give a chance to construct your story about why you needed to sleep your way to the top? I'm such an idiot. We haven't even slept together yet. Hello, and welcome to my presentation on why you should go fuck yourself. Spoiler alert, it's because you're a piece of shit no one likes. Now the solution here is incredibly simple, and I imagine a good number of you have already figured it out. Because of that innocent kiss on the cheek thing, and the fact that both of them love each other, and I've said that's a red herring like half a dozen times. And this wraps a lot of things up and makes things a lot clearer because Spellman is Zade's father. You are the father. That's it, that's the reveal. That's why Zade was able to walk on with an audition and get a job on the spot. That's why Zade was able to perform as well as she has. That's why everything with the last couple of chapters in this red herring. All Zaid had to say was, It's my daddy! God! And instead, no, she just gives a vague non-answer. And I would be less annoyed at this if it weren't for a crucial step that she had set up for herself. I can't really explain it with that context. I'll have to, to go over the show first. The important thing is, Matt gets pissed off and he doesn't want to do the show anymore, so he gets Cam to uh, run the main board. And at this point, I want to remind you that everyone in the show had some kind of understudy or backup. And you would think that Mac would call his backup, but apparently Cam has a bit of trouble. Mac looked up and glared at him hard. You're running main tonight. 
I don't know the cues for the new illusion. Heck, I haven't worked in automation in over a year. I can't, Cam tried to argue. Run it on the fly, Mac yelled as he stomped off, wrapped up in a flurry of emotion. Now, if you've ever worked in a theater, running things on the fly without knowing the cues should come off as an obvious what are you doing moment. How do you know when to cue up certain music? How do you know when to cue up certain light sets? Because the lights need to show shine on certain spots and in certain ways. Sometimes they, you know, flash over the, the stadium or the, the house. And sometimes they gotta focus on certain people on certain spots on the stage during different parts of the night. Why doesn't Mac actually have backup for this? Why doesn't he have an assistant technical director? That moment's stupid, but it's not nearly as stupid as what Zade does. And you will understand it as we get into chapter 15, The Tower, and we finally get to see what this big show, this new illusion, really is. Part of the reason why this new show took so long to develop was because the illusion used complex, deep, chaos-based magic. Now, what does that mean? What does chaos magic entail? I have no idea. That's all you get. It's chaos magic. Chaos! Spellman calls the trick creation. Now, something I want you to keep in mind as I'm going through this. Consider how much buildup this trick has been given. How much importance has been given in the last several chapters. How long they've been working on this. How appreciative Spellman was towards uh, his little starlet, Zade. How much work went into this, how many people are involved. All of that build up for what I'm about to describe. And to make it easier, I am just going to paraphrase because as you can imagine, it's wordy as hell. So I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step breakdown of what this thing is going off some prepared notes. In the interest of fairness, I will be showing uh, appropriate cues from the book when I can fit them in. So you get an idea of what it looks like as these steps are introduced. You'll need to pause it to actually read them because I'm going to be going through these point by point pretty quick. But my intention is to give you a solid understanding as to how tremendously disappointing this will be. So Zaid steps out. She takes center stage as Spellman introduces the trick and calls it creation. And Sophia's somewhere off singing, I guess. Step one, stir and froth water around the stage. Step two, wave crashes over Zade and she disappears, leaving only her cloak on stage. Step three, rain falls on stage. Step four, water turns into sand as it hit the stage. Step five, sand piled up until it was hit by lightning. Step six, Glass figurine emerged from the sand pile where the lightning hit. Step seven. Second bolt of lightning hits sand and grows an apple tree complete with apples. Step eight, young man, possibly naked, falls from apple tree branch and lands at Spellman's feet. Young man apparently looks like a teenage Spellman. Step nine, boy picks up an ax from the sand and chops the tree down. Step 10, Tree catches fire. Step 11, fire and sand clears, revealing a wardrobe. Step 12, young man opens wardrobe, reveals it's empty, then closes it, then opens it again, revealing a guitar. He takes the guitar and puts the glass figure into the wardrobe, sits down, and plays the guitar. Step 13, lightning hits the wardrobe, which splits in two, cracked open, and Zade steps out. Oh, my God. Step 14! Zaid takes an apple out of her pocket, bites it, and faints. Step 15, boy kisses her. Zaid wakes up, feeds him the apple, and he disappears. Step 16, Charles puts Zaid's old cloak on her. Step 17, lightning strikes Zade, she disappears, and cloak falls to the ground again. Step 18, Spellman bites the apple and he disappears too. Step 19, Spellman reappears from an entrance on the stage, not sure where that is, and takes a bow. That was the dumbest fucking trick ever. Aside from how tedious 
and repetitive it was. The trick starts on page 277 and ends on 285. Eight pages to get through one trick, which is really a disappearing and reappearing act over and over again. Granted, there were elements like the rain or the lightning, but by and large, the trick was just, here's a thing, oh, it's gone, here's a thing, oh, it's gone. The best magic tricks leave you guessing, wondering how the heck did they do that? This trick is a long series of nifty events, but because we don't know it's real magic, there's, ironically, no magic in it for the reader. Also, sometimes a multi-step plan coming together can be fun and exciting, Ocean's Eleven, for example, but this was too much of the same over and over. Lightning strikes, then something disappears or reappears. And actually, this trick was doomed from the start because everything was told from Zade's perspective. We don't get that moment of awe that you get as, as a member of the audience watching a trick performed in front of you because you know uh, that it's all real magic. You understand everything that's going on. And, and again, there's no magic in the trick. You know what would have made this illusion even better? If we got the trick from the audience's perspective instead of Zade's. In The Prestige, the reason the big disappearing act works so well is because we don't learn how it works until the very end. We see it performed a few times, we get a solid idea through clues as what's going on, but we don't learn the secret until the end of the movie. This point would also work with The Illusionist, or Now You Can See Me. It's that element of mystery, of mystique, that makes the, the trick so impressive, so much fun. But because we know what's going on the entire time, I'm wasting my time for the entire trick, just waiting for it to be over, impressed that it's going for as long as it does. The trick feels like it's supposed to be this cheap callback to Adam and Eve and the, the Chronicles of Narnia, but I mean, aside from a cheap surface, le uh, surface level visual, there's no real personality behind it. There's no connection to anything else really going on. This is, at best, an homage to the Bible. Which, like, okay, cool, but why? I mean, is this to insinuate that God used chaos magic? Oh, but then we get to why using chaos magic was so incredibly reckless. Zade ends up collapsing backstage because there was a little problem with how the trick was performed. See, she needed an anchor to anchor her energy onto, because I guess that's how her magic works now. And that anchor happened to be Mac. Why Mac? What if he had been sick that day? What if he had to be called away for any number of reasons? Would the trick then be impossible? Would she be able to just shift it over to somebody else? Can just anybody be that anchor if they're nearby? If that's the case, why not Spellman? Because he's right there on stage with you! And it's not like this is a small thing. Zade like coughs up blood or something and collapses. Her whole body was on fire. If chaos magic was actually that dangerous and that unstable, why fuck with it? To put on a show like none other? Um, couldn't you have at least given us a decent trick if you're gonna do that? Chris Angel puts on better illusions than this, and he actually pays people to be impressed by some of the things he does for TV. I'll give Spellman a pass because, you know, he's not a mage and he doesn't really know how all of this works. But Zeb's a real mage. He should know how stupid this was. Zade's an idiot, so I will guess we'll give her a pass, but there's that other woman on, on staff who's a mage. How prevalent are mages? And yet no one said, by the way, screwing with chaos magic is kind of insanely dangerous. This entire theater is filled with idiots. And the last thing Zade says before she passes out and they take her to the hospital is call my mother. And then this leads to one of the most perplexing style choices of the entire book. So I'm gonna say it straight up. Zade spends the next hundred pages in a coma. One fourth of this book has the main character unconscious. But don't worry because you still see the entire story play out 
from Zade's perspective, despite her switching to third-person perspective to follow other characters several times in the book. So she passes out and immediately we get, that's the last thing I personally remembered from that day. Later, after I'd had some time to rest, I pulled out the memories of what everyone else saw and what happened. When you pull out memories using magic, they pretty much feel like they are your memories, but you're also seeing yourself from that other point of view. That means you're only seeing what, other, what the other person saw, though, so you might not get a full picture of the information you're looking for. In this case, because people were scattered around at the end of the show, it took pulling several different people's memories to get the full picture of what had happened that day. So, you already know that she's going to be fine! The next hundred pages try to play it out as, Oh my god, Zayd might never recover from this! Even though they were getting the story from her perspective. This drives out all of the narrative tension the book is currently trying to build. All of the conflict is eroding immediately as the book is introducing it. This is like trying to dam a river using leaves when you're introducing them one leaf at a time as they're being swept downstream. God, this is stupid. So the EMTs swing by, they pick up Zade and they start to take her to the hospital and Spellman is forced to admit in front of Mac that he is Zade's father. Immediately getting rid of that little conflict. And then for some reason we get this scene. Zade is currently in the hospital at this point. She, you know, still pulling memories and all, but the girl who had stopped me that day in the parking garage of the mall, the one who pinned me to the wall using magic, arrived at the hospital. Not only did I find out that she was there, but she seemed to make a point of being seen when she didn't have to, which led me to believe she knew I would look later or at least that someone would look and would see her. I still had no idea why she was there or why she purposely wanted to be seen. And that's it. We don't get her until, I guess, the sequel. At the hospital, though, the doctors have no idea what's wrong with Zaid. Understandable, because this is all caused by chaos magic. And the doctor says that he wishes that Dr. House was a real person because this is his kind of case. And then... Spellman asks who Dr. House is, and Mac explains it over the course of two paragraphs, thus solidly ruining the joke. Again, brevity is the soul of wit. Spellman contacts Zade's mother, Della, and Della instructs him to bring Zade to Tennessee, because she can heal Zade, but modern medicine can't. Okay, magic, get it. And we get some of the most pointless chapters in the book as we just get backstory upon backstory that really exists just to draw out the book. So I think this would be a good time to talk about that last controversy I had mentioned. Did you know that Lanny Serum has an IMDB page? Now Serum has explained that she always wanted to be the uh, hot young action star protagonist of a story, but no one really gave her that chance, so she decided to make her own story. And normally, I would praise that as a fantastic goal. I'm gonna go build my own theme park with blackjack and hookers. In fact, forget the park. And so she decided to write Handbook for Mortals, the screenplay. Part of the reason why this story is such a complete mess isn't just because Sarum has next to no talent as an author, it's also because she just lazily shifted formats from screenplay to novel, and they are very different things. There's almost no life in the characters just on the dialogue alone, which would be primarily what the screenplay would be, but she went overboard on the prose in between all of the, the dialogue. That's why the book is so prose heavy. That's why it's so difficult to get through, because she doesn't know what she's doing. She is basically writing stage directions and emotions for all the characters to experience. It's less like a novel and more like a screenplay written by the most demanding, nitpicking, micromanaging screenwriter of all time. And to make this fun, we're just gonna talk about it like it's a conspiracy. And that's when the whole story gets compounded, when she runs into Glory from Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Kevin from American Pie. Like I said before, Sarum had her foot in several doors in a couple of industries. Not 
necessarily on any level that means anything, but she knew a few people. One of them was the head of Geek Nation itself, Claire Kramer, also known as Glory. Slayer's a robot. Did everybody else know the Slayer was a robot? Glory. That, that was actually a really good season. That was, that was a good show. And there's also Thomas Ian Nichols, or Nicholas, sorry. No longer will our penises remain flaccid and unused. Well, both Glory and Kevin uh, agreed to help Serum with this little plot in small ways. Claire Kramer was the head of Geek Nation, which was then just a... Uh, a site dedicated to geeks and pop culture. And they decided to switch over to an actual publication company. That's part of the reason why the uh, scam they tried pulling on the New York Times bestseller list didn't work, because this company started publication and one month later had a number one hit in the New York Times bestsellers list. To understand that degree of luck is like getting a winning lottery ticket that you randomly picked up from the street. It also doesn't help that they oversold their hands and bought way too many copies. Now, there's not an exact formula that the New York Times list is open with about how to get on the bestsellers list. Most people seem to think that it's about five to 10,000 book sales to, to show up, so attainable. The people at Geek Nation decided to overshoot that and went for 18,000. And this is information that was confirmed by author Phil Stamper. And of course, as soon as the New York Times found out about this, they swept her right off to the number one spot, deservedly so. At the same time, they were already underway trying to get things ready for a movie deal, which involved pulling Thomas Ian Nicholas, who agreed to appear as a producer and to star as, I believe, Tad. Serum, of course, was going to play Zade. Which is really weird when you consider that she is over 40 years old. There are a lot of jokes out there about actors in their 20s playing teenagers. I don't think Serum can really pull off a 25 year old. See that right there? That is far too desperately clinging to your glory days. Pun retroactively intended. And they were so sure that this movie was going to go through that they actually have it plastered all over the book. Inside jacket cover. Hambo for Mortals is in development as a motion picture set to debut in 2018. On the back jacket, under the About the Author section, Handbook for Mortals is her debut novel of a series of books, which are also being made into feature films. On the website, handbookseries.com, Handbook for Mortals premiered in August 2017 as a USA Today bestseller and is already in the works to be made into a motion picture. Back cover, Handbook for Mortals is soon to be a major motion picture. They were so convinced this was going to be a roaring success, they put all of their eggs in one basket, and it completely collapsed. At this point, Serum's name has become associated with plagiarism and fraud. I don't think anyone's gonna be offering her a movie deal anytime soon. But that doesn't mean that she can't still get into pictures. Like I said, she does have an IMDb page, and she brags about some of her appearances in the About the Author section. She has, in fact, appeared in films before, and they include things like Paul Blart, Mall Cop 2. Jason Bourne, 2016. And she's also been in Miss Congeniality 2. But life as an uncredited extra only takes you so far. After a while, you want a real taste at fame, a real part to play, something to really capture your energy. And so, she persuaded her friend Kevin from American Pie to give her a part in an upcoming project of his. Trailer Park Shark. It is exactly as bad as you think it is. Just check out the trailer. You know, it would really suck if somebody with a semi-successful YouTube channel actually came across her work and decided to put it on full display for the internet to enjoy. You know how Sharknado was successful because it was this self-aware piece of crap that just kept poking fun at the concept of monster movies. Well, this isn't. 
and it's horrible. Trailer Park Shark is exactly the kind of really, really stupid monster movie that you think it is that can only exist on the Sci-Fi Channel and stars Tara Reid. And it's true, Serum does have a speaking role and a named character in this movie. In a single scene which is so brief I can show you the entire thing without worrying about copyright. Would you like to see it? Hey, Roxy. Hey, you know, my wash is still broken. Uh, if you fix it for me, I'd make it worth your while. <sighs> Listen, I told you, I'm with Jolene. I mean, I can make it worth her while or y'all's while. All right, we'll see you later. Uh, no. Well, ask her about it. Hey, Sapphire. That was incredible. Her entire character would be summed up as woman who propositions herself to get a washing machine fixed. Yep. She's moving up in the world! Now, I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm making fun of Sarah for wanting to be a Hollywood star. I'd love that myself as well, short of all the drugs and prostitution I'd have to do, but still. However, I will make fun of her for trying to prop herself up like this big Hollywood star that she clearly is not. It doesn't say that she's an uncredited extra in the About the Author section of this book. She just says she was in Mall Cop 2 and Jason Bourne. And Trailer Park Shark is mentioned as well. There's selling yourself, then there's lying to your customers. She is very much doing the second. All of that work to try to get this turned into a movie. Was it worth it? Alright, but finishing up with the story. And remember, all these scenes are being told from Zade's perspective because she's pulling memories, whatever the fuck that means. Spellman and Mac make their way to Tennessee with uh, Zade's body in tow, and Spellman accepts full responsibility for Zade being in the shape she is. Dully, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I let her do the show. It's my fault. Mom softened as she called her Deli, the name he had called her when they were both younger. It sounded like deli, as in sandwiches, which I guess Charles would claim was a joke about his two favorite things, my mother and submarine sandwiches. I had to admit it was cute the way he had said it, even if it reminded me instantly of corned beef and Dr. Brown's cherry soda. What in God's holy name are you blathering about? Yeah, it's jokes and moments like that that cut through the tension and ruin what's otherwise supposed to be a suspenseful atmosphere. This entire section just leads into Chapter 17, which is a background story about how uh, Deli and Spellman met when they were both working at a small town circus. Della began to tell Mac the story of how my parents met and how I came into existence. There's so much wrong with that sentence, I don't know where to start. As I scanned through Mac's recollection of her retelling him the story, I was reminded that my mother can be a magical storyteller, weaving the words of any story into a beautiful tapestry so vivid, you'd swear you were watching a motion picture directed by Steven Spielberg. Yeah, except the author's writing skills can't support that. You tell us we're getting E.T., but we're actually getting Mac and me. And I pretty much get to skip this whole chapter because it doesn't really do anything. It's just flirting back and forth between Spellman and Della, and it ends with them kind of liking each other. Della offers to give Spellman a reading with her tarot cards, and this is a good representation of the kind of flirting these two do and why I'm so not engaged. If you put your energy into the cards, it will be much easier. They don't bite, I promise. I may, but they don't. She knew how to be witty as well. Stop driving at home so hard, it's not funny! Do you get it? Do you get my joke about the track? Okay, there's a whole page of this. So a lot of what's supposed to be driving these two together is because Della is trying to help Charles figure out why he's been having trouble sleeping lately. Because he's been having nightmares about somebody coming by and murdering him. And apparently the culprit, according to the cards, is going to be his assistant, Betty. From this day forward, you will all refer to me by the name Betty. <laughs> you see, Charles broke the cardinal rule of sleeping with somebody. Don't stick your dick in crazy. He stuck his dick in crazy, and now Betty's crazy about him, and is going to murder him because he doesn't feel the same way. But to the book's credit, it does give us something that I find weirdly refreshing, and I'm a little alarmed that we don't get more of this. Since you slept with her that one night, you've been brushing her off, 
and she's been getting more and more upset with you. She sneaks through the camp at night and watches you sleep. Charles made a perplexed face and replied sarcastically, That's not creepy at all! I have said on multiple occasions to stop idolizing stalkers. Why is this book the one that gets it right? And through this entire exchange, through all the shallow explanations and the meaningless drivel that these two share, Della finds herself somewhat attracted to Charles, as if the author just wanted it to happen and didn't take the time to naturally flesh out these characters. People do crazy things sometimes, especially women, and especially for love. I am not really sure what she sees in you, but love is deaf, dumb, and blind, as they say. She threw in a jab, though to be honest, she was starting to see what Betty had seen in him. He was charming, magnetic, and extremely good-looking. She was sure that when he was trying to woo a girl, he was probably pretty irresistible. So that whole conflict gets resolved when he wears a bulletproof vest to his next show, and Betty isn't able to kill him when she switches out the fake gun with a real gun. Chapter 18, The Chariot. So Serum really tries to build up the tension of, oh my god, is... Zade gonna survive because it's a, it's a really dangerous operation to try to revive her. Completely discounting the fact that Zade's the one telling the story at the moment, so clearly she survives, but... We do get this interesting line, though, because Serum gives us a little peek as to what makes magic possible. So, do you worship the devil? He speculated. He wasn't a go-to-church-on-Sunday kind of guy, but he did believe in God. Della scoffed at his question while shaking her head. Hardly. No, just like everything beautiful, magic comes from God. Prayer is a form of magic. So if everything beautiful comes from God, does that mean my hair is divine? I'm not incredibly vain at all! What are you talking about? This chapter just keeps going on and on as we get all this irrelevant detail. Just It exists just to draw the story out. Like this line, it's just... Serum failing to sound poignant. When you love someone, it's a force that exists despite what walls you put up to hide how you feel. Their eyes couldn't lie about how much they loved each other. Why do I feel like I'm in some bad episode of Bewitched? Uh, this is the part that confirms that uh, Zaid needed to use an anchor for her magic. Why would she do that without telling me? Mac asked, sorrow in his voice and pain reflected across his face. Well, I did it with Charles for years without him knowing, and she knew that. Of course, Charles was in the show, so he couldn't have left. It's really dangerous to use someone who is unaware without a surefire way of knowing they won't leave. This is the author openly admitting that her protagonist is stupid. Spellman knew about magic, and he was in the show! Why not use him? And speaking of stupid, there's the plan to revive Zade. Apparently... There's a little ritual that requires Mac to stab her. Della explains, Normally, I would sugarcoat this, but we don't really have that kind of time. I'm just going to get down and dirty and to the point. Please try not to freak out. I have to forge a... Um, well, it doesn't matter what it really is. It's going to look like a dagger, though it won't actually be a dagger at all. It's not worth explaining to you what it really is, other than it's magic. At 3 o'clock sharp tonight, you're going to have to plunge it into her heart on my altar outside. And if they don't do this, Zade will die! Big fat hairy deal. Uh, we get... Another contradiction in the magic, because Spellman explains, I found out later, though, that she did put a spell on me not to talk about Zade, or to admit to a connection to either of them. So Spellman could not explain, because of magic, that he was Zade's father, and yet was able to effortlessly explain to the medic that he was Zade's father. How? Chapter 19, Death. So this one is the uh, big ritual, and it's it's called Death, but this is like one of the only things about tarot I know. But um, Death does not actually necessarily mean death. It really means change. So the title is something of a misnomer. I mean, it's not really. It's just misleading. Because this is where Zade goes from 
in a coma to not in a coma. And also naming the chapter Death, like to tease the uninitiated into tarot is a waste because again, Zade's the narrator. But they get the ritual started and they prepare Zade's body on the altar. Charles took the ropes that Della also had in her hands and bound my legs and arms to the table. Della ripped my shirt just enough to expose the middle of my chest. Kinky. Oh, not like that, pervert. And to give you an idea of how misguided, the, the, the kind of tangents that are happening during all of this setup, Max starts thinking to himself as he prepares to stab Zaid in the chest with a dagger, which by the way, if he doesn't stab her correctly, will actually kill her, cause it'll work like a real dagger. Mac has to believe, he has to focus, and despite that, he's not focusing, and he's thinking about stuff like this. It reminded Mac of something he had seen in a movie once, where it was called Dragon's Blood. It crossed his mind that maybe the folks in Hollywood had gotten the idea from something that was actually real. That began to make him wonder, if magic was actually real, what else did people go around thinking was made up that actually existed as well? What about werewolves, vampires, fairies, genies, or Never Never Land? Was everything made up really based off of reality? He thought of all the wonderful and terrible things that might actually be out in the world and silently laughed at the irony, not really knowing if he was actually correct. Tonal consistency. If you cannot maintain total consistency, then the reader gets pulled out of the moment and is less engaged, and the whole moment just comes off as stupid. And then the ritual itself, and I am going to absolutely butcher this, but I'm going to try anyway. Max started to recite the ancient text he had been taught as he held himself steady directly over where I lay. The words were odd, and Mac didn't know what they really meant, because when Della offered to explain them to him, he had said he didn't want to know. His exact words had been, As long as I'm not conjuring demons, I don't want to know. Mac yelled into the wind and the rain, Sa ovim bodezom prozet magi stari e moj ver neka lzbuvav peru kreen kliv tu ja Vaskerni da dusu i tello via guardrich verdesi. Needless to say, if I were in Max's position, Zade would be extremely dead or turned into some sort of elder horror. I don't know. Unlike me, though, Mac can actually pronounce those words, and the ritual works. Zade wakes up and coughs up blood, but she still has a long recovery period, which could be who knows how long. And there's some more stuff going on that I'm so bored by that I cannot be asked to recall any of it. Mac even calls Jackson to let him know how Zade is doing, which is nice, but also kind of solidifies the idea that Jackson was never a real contender in this love triangle. He was a mild distraction at best. So eventually Zade wakes up and then Mac comes in for the crowning moment of apologizing for being a dick, even though Zade could have solved all of these problems and not gotten into this position if she had just been open and honest in the first place. So, uh, great lesson for the kids there. And Mac's apology is so drawn out to such a ridiculous degree, I swear Serum is just trying to draw this out by using as many ellipses as she possibly can. Zade, I really need to talk to you, er, to tell you something. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, um, I'm really sorry I didn't trust you with your Charles, er, your dad, I mean, Charles, it was wrong of me and I'll, I'll never question your motives again. What's really impressive is that Mac's apology was so bumbling and awkward he would have saved a lot of face if he had instead hired a barbershop quartet. I'm fucking sorry and I miss your nipples. I do. So, Zaid wakes up, eventually returns to the theater, and everything just gets better for everybody. Jackson gets to open for Imagine Dragons. Zaid tells everyone that she had a combination of ailments, including double pneumonia, which supposedly was why she couldn't breathe and what caused her to pass out, and something called osler weber rendu syndrome. Apparently it's a real condition that's also called hereditary hemorrhagic telling gliss gust I'm not getting that right. Tad greets Mac and Zade as they come back to the theater and 
asks what took them so long and if they just got back last night. And Mac tells him, no, we got back day before yesterday, but we were running around with all the wedding plans, Mac said, almost rolling his eyes. Guys never seem to understand the importance of all the details for a wedding. I'm pretty sure Mac would have worn his show blacks if he thought I would have let him get away with that. He was clearly joking, so I can only assume that Zade has zero empathy and is not able to connect to other people in any meaningful dimension. And they drive this joke into the ground so hard you'd think they were drilling for oil. The hardest thing was this one. Finding a dress, Mac said, pointing at me. It's one day, for heaven's sake. It is one day, but a rather important day for me, I said firmly. So, did you find a dress? Tad asked, looking directly at me this time. Finally, I answered in exasperation. I think we went to every store from Tennessee to here. I laughed a little at the exaggeration. Exciting stuff, Tad commented, though I could hear the sarcasm in his voice. It is. I smiled and agreed though it was with some hesitation uh, that was probably noticeable in my voice. And more stuff doesn't happen, and the chapter ends with them making out chapter 21, The World. <laughs> Opening lines, you may now kiss the bride. All the talk about marriage, you'd think it was Mac and Zade, but nope. Turns out it's Spellman and Della getting remarried. What happened to Sophia? Fuck you for asking! She's probably dead in a ditch. I don't know, she's not in the book anymore. And of course, because this book has to follow so many other cliches, when it comes to the bouquet scene, Zade catches it. Mostly because Della used magic to cheat. Can't fight destiny, sweetheart. Some things are just meant to be. I learned that the hard way, Max said as he smiled and nudged me. So it seems, I said thoughtfully, laughing to myself. Think there's a book or something out there? Mac asked. Book? I turned to clarify whether I had heard the right word. I wasn't sure what he needed a book for because I had already caught the bouquet. I'm going to drown you. I'm going to drown you like a sack of dumb puppies. Yeah, you know, like a handbook for mortals just so I can keep up. <laughs> and then the book closes on the dumbest ending I think I've ever seen. And they lived happily ever after. Or do they? Huh? I, I don't know that. <laughs> and that's the end of the book, but if you, if you need to have a little bit more, don't worry, you can turn the page for an exciting teaser from the second book in the saga due out in 2018. Oh, I didn't know there was a second book out already. Well, let's just go and check Goodreads and... Oh, oh, that's disappointing. Well, for some reason, you do need a part two of this story. Go check out Caleb Joseph's video on it. It's quite amusing. But I'm not sure why you would want that because, oh my God, was this awful. The worst thing about the book were the controversies behind the scenes, but the story itself was incompetent, pointless, served only to tell us why Zade was awesome, and had no depth into it. Uh, an awful story that told no color, that existed only to prop up the author. There is no reason for this book to exist. The prose was meandering and directionless. The characters were absolutely flat. The, the dialogue was uninteresting. The direction was unengaging. Several scenes were completely pointless. Zaid was this self-absorbed, malicious, little look-at-me, look-at-me girl, and really does not come off as relatable, or enjoyable, or attractive, or fun. She was just... She was the obnoxious girl from class who demanded to be the center of attention. That says a lot about the author, I think. All right, just going through a few notes to see if I missed anything. This book opens to four quotes from different authors. One is fine, two is pushing it, and four makes it look like the author is so indecisive they couldn't decide what quote, uh, quote fit the book best. So that wasn't a great start. Zane and her mom live in a religious part of the country that would literally burn her at the stake if they knew that she was a real witch, but they'd not only tolerate her but celebrate her according to one passage. Mom and I, uh, my mom and I had enlightened some people in town, so you're getting a lot of mixed messages right at the start. 
Zane mentions how heated she was during the initial argument with her mother, and then says that she almost wanted to punch her mother. In that same paragraph, a few sentences later, she said she was so mad that if she were a cartoon, smoke would have been coming out of her ears. Complete tonal inconsistency. Is this an angry moment or a funny moment? Don't screw with your readers like this because then they don't know how they're supposed to feel. Serum spent more time describing the theaters they will be working in instead of the guy she'll be working for. I do not understand what her priorities are. Sophia only exists to solidify the idea that Spellman dates them really, really young. Then he winds up with Della anyway, so... That was a waste. Zade talks about judging people while they judge her, then goes on some pseudo-intellectual ramble about uh, that being human nature. It's the kind of shallow intellectualism that you get from college students that are halfway through an elective course and act like they've uncovered the secrets of the universe. The plot is a complete mess. Zade doesn't fit neatly into it. The plot has to mold itself around her while she wanders around, unsure what to do. I've run D&D &D campaigns with newbies who do a better job of staying on track. Stupid line. I had a new life for myself. A somewhat normal life. How the hell is the life of a Las Vegas performer working alongside a guy comparable to David Copperfield considered a normal life? You want normal? Go become a paralegal in a law firm in Cleveland. When people ask Zaid how she performed her audition trick, she unironically acts like uh, Leslie Nielsen from Naked Gun. Please disperse! Nothing to see here! Stupid line. As annoyed as I was, I couldn't help but notice how piercing Max Hazel eyes were. This is a good example of how Zade will throw things out there like romance, making reading this book awkward and clunky. Guys like him didn't hit women, no matter how mad we made him. Lines like this just demonstrate how Zade's ability to read people means uh, making things convenient for her. She'll never be in real trouble, and the plot feels like it's setting itself up to placate to her. She'll likely get out of needing to show how the trick is done by Spellman vouching for her. And that's exactly what happens. Oh, yes, this was great. So I got bored when researching uh, some stuff about Jackson, and I decided to look up the etymology of the name Millsap. Millsap has roots in medieval England, thought to have come from the word milksop, that meant a piece of bread soaked in milk. Otherwise, came off as a nickname for a spiritless man. And considering that Zade does not pick Jackson in the end, that nickname seems all too appropriate. Stupid line, considering how much I wanted to keep my secret a secret, I probably brought too much attention to myself. Gee, you think? Zaid's full name, Scheherazad, comes from Arabian Nights. For some reason, these chapters don't feel like moments in a larger story. Instead, they all seem like vignettes that exist to make Zaid look good or show how others feel about her. It's more like a book of short stories with Zaid as the central theme instead of an independent novel. Scenes happen, but oftentimes without significant impact or any apparent relevancy to the larger narrative. Most of the dialogue and descriptors include things that you haven't thought were cool since you were in middle school. You thought Sailor Moon was an awesome magical girl? Please, compared to Zane, she's just a ditz with meatballs in her hair. As I go through these chapters, I can't help but notice how some of these chapter titles were forced in, like they were like the story was molded specifically to match what the chapter title was. In Jackson's first concert, in the bar scene in Chapter 8, I think it was, it took the MC more than a page for him to walk on stage and finally announce the band. There is so much irrelevant drivel that it's kind of hard to keep track of what's going on. The only reason I'm not lost is because of how vapid and simplistic the vocabulary and prose is. Zade spends very little time chatting with girls, and is usually confrontational aside from the goth makeup girl. You know, that's almost kind of sad because it makes it look like Zaid can't relate to her peers, and she relies on guys as friends, but those guys are only friends because they want to sleep with her. I will accept I am looking way too hard into that, and that is not an actual statement of fact, but I don't know, it seems probable. Zade narrates that Mac was a wear-his-heart-on-his-sleeve kind of guy. No, he's not. Mac has always been withdrawn from other people for most of the book. He sat by himself during that scene that Sophia was trying to seduce him, and he has been completely closed off to how he feels about Zade and why he was so upfront about her and why he wasn't willing to date a performer. All of these details had to come from other people. The only exception up to this point was the loading dock scene in Chapter 4. The book keeps toying with the idea of a love triangle, but it's so obvious that Sarum wants Zade to wind up with Mac. They both get long, repeated, detailed scenes of being cute 
together. Then Jackson shows up and lightly flirts with Zade. It's like this is the Zade and Mac show, with Jackson popping in to say hi now and then. Uh, when the biker bumps into Zade, Zade knocks the biker off his bike. The bike crashes into a bench hard enough to break the bike into pieces, but somehow the biker is left without any permanent injuries. And somehow, Mac doesn't notice any of this. Stupid line, I had hoped what I had done to the biker would teach him a karma-related lesson. First, that's not how karma works. Second, how would he associate bumping into you with crashing his bike? He might not have even noticed he hit you. Sometimes that happens. There's video footage of uh, airplanes crashing into each other, and the size difference is so incredible that one plane doesn't notice that there was an accident at all. This book suffers from a lot of wouldn't it be cool if moments. These are moments that only exist to prop up a moment, a character, or a group of characters as something awesome, then immediately go away and have no real additional impact on the plot or characters. Examples do not include Deus Ex Machinas, anything with Michael Bay's name on it, or the time Indiana Jones shot that one dude. Zade explains why using chaos magic is so dangerous when we get this line. One wrong move, and it could all go to H-E double hockey sticks real quick. Seriously, Zade, how old are you? Who the H-E double fuck are you? Young Charles and Della in a nutshell. He was a womanizer with a celebrity complex, and she was an angry jigglypuff. I'm curious to what the backstory between Charles and Della was supposed to mean for the story overall. My guess is that it could very easily be truncated, but it wasn't to meet some arbitrary word count. Della suggests Charles wear a bulletproof vest under his clothes when Betty tries to murder him during his next show. Her plan is to switch out the bullets so that he'll actually be shot. Bulletproof vests can be hidden under loose clothes, but it really helps if you know what you're doing. For example, just look at what Onion pulled when he took Repsy into court. I cannot do one of these videos without making fun of Onision. Stupid line, he was more hooked than a housewife watching Days of Our Lives. Side note, I'm actually impressed that that show is still on the air. Stupid line, we do magic, the real kind, spelled with a K. Not the stuff Charlie does. Not mortal, but not immortal either. Because everything spelled with a K is just that much better. Stupid line that Zade gave while she was still in a coma. I had no memory of this except theirs. And because she has explained that she's in a coma and she's reading other people's memories, this is incredibly redundant. Mac is getting awfully invested in Zaid. It doesn't feel like he feels responsible for her predicament so much as they're just destined to fall in love because God or something. They haven't even gone beyond first base, so this feels incredibly superficial. Yeah, so that's all that. This book was a chore. I managed to stay on about a chapter a day when I was reading it, but... I had to kind of force myself. The story, the novel as a whole, was so unengaging that the only way I could really get myself invested at all was by doing research on the side about like all the controversies and, and the stupid stuff that Serum did. And again, watching Generally Pookie's videos as soon as uh, I was done with each chapter. But Zaid is one of the most unengaging protagonists I have ever come across. She is so selfish, so self-centered, so self-invested that anyone who disagrees with her or slights her in any way is automatically wrong. Like I said in the last part, this book exists only to tell you why Zayd is awesome. But because Zayd herself is not a compelling or fun character, there's no reason to read it at all. Sky Turner wrote on the back cover, The fortune tellers have looked into the future and the next big thing is here. Handbook for Mortals is a page-turning read unlike anything you've seen before. Prepare to be enticed. Unlike anything I've seen before and yet I'm getting airs of Twilight and Empress Teresa, not good things to compare your book to. If I had to sum this book up as simply as I could, I would refer to an old demotivational poster involving a bent fork which said, just because you are unique does not mean you are useful. Well, that one's done. I'm sure you guys won't mind if I take a small break before I engage in my next project because that one I'm not looking forward to. It's not out yet, but it will be. 
early next month, when Twilight returns with Midnight Sun. Nope.